Hey, it's Mazzy. Welcome back. Another of the best of 2023, the best records of the year. This list is dedicated to the best archival issues and the best reissues. Comps, a couple of comps included, I believe, here too. Uh, now, there's no jazz in this particular list. I'm going to keep that separate because there's so many wonderful uh, jazz. As you know, we're in the, the golden age of jazz reissues. So I'm going to make that a separate video. Uh, it'll hit over the next few weeks or so. So um, before I start out, I need to do a little response uh, and update uh, to my box set video. There'll be a link at the end to that video if you haven't seen it. I uh, The first one I dropped were the best box sets of 2023. And the one that people kept bringing up that they said, you forgot this, and their favorite one was the Who's Lifehouse. Now, uh, I didn't include it for several reasons, so I'm just kind of explaining this to you. I did not get the big box set of the Lifehouse, Pete Townsend demos, and uh, what became Who's Next, the big CD master box with the book and the graphic novel. And it, it looks really amazing. I went for uh, the box set that has the San Francisco show, and I know the big box has it as well, but I wanted the Who Live at the Civic Auditorium San Francisco 1971 because I attended that show. It also has uh, the updated Who's Next. I have so many versions of that. I would say this one's okay uh, sound-wise, but um, I was very disappointed with the sound of that uh, show. And usually archive recordings don't have to necessarily be great sounding records, but it surprises me that um, that sounds so bad, uh, considering it either was a 16 or 24 track remote at the Civic Center. Now, I've been to that venue many times. It's not a great sounding venue, but for some reason, you know, so I didn't include this for one. And since I don't have the, um, the big box, I didn't include it, but it sounds great. Wonderful. And one that I admitted, and I really just totally forgot about it, and I think one or two people uh, called it out, and this should have been included. And this is one of the best comps ever in the history of comps. Uh, and this is an expanded comp that Lenny K put together for Record Store Day. It's Nuggets, the box set. And this is the uh, 50th anniversary of the original artifacts from the first psychedelic era. Some of the greatest American uh, garage psychedelic songs. Uh, from 1965, six, seven, pretty much in that era. And uh, this is expanded set, has the original album, and it has a second uh, disc, uh, second album of two more discs, and then a third uh, one and a, uh, a wonderful booklet. Lenny Kay actually toured several cities with some guest artists where they uh, performed some of these songs live. So. I've seen that. In fact, I just saw it at Easy Street Records, a, c a couple copies they have. So it is around, and I highly recommend that box set, one of the greatest box sets. I omitted it. It should have been there. And there we go. So now reissues and archival issues for 2023. I picked 20, and I'm going to rank them from 20 to number one. Now, it's so hard ranking these things because I... I I've already changed the list probably about six or seven times. I went through it. I changed the order. I threw a few off. I added a few on. And uh, for number 20, I'm going to start with Steely Dan. Yes, Steely Dan's Asia. This is the UHQR. This is the way it should have come out. Sans uh, the extra uh, packaging, not necessary. But I will say this UHQR is an amazing sounding record. The best version I've ever heard. But... Having said that, why is it so low in number 20? Because it sounds good. Every version pretty much of this record sounds amazing. So do you really need a UHQR if you have a good sounding original? Eh, probably not. Uh, but again, uh, if you watch my take on this record, it was sentimental because it's the first record I promoted at ABC. So coming in number 20, Analog Productions, uh, Steely Dan's Asia that came out in 1977 on ABC Records and, um, you know, great package. You all know the doodah things of UHQR. So that's the only thing like that I included there. Then coming at it, number 19. And this was uh, someone I'd heard of but didn't know a lot about. And this is some, somewhat a little out of the box 
for what I show in my videos. Although uh, this, I do like avant-garde and experimental music and neoclassical. And this is Arthur Russell's picture of a bunny rabbit. And um, he died, I believe, in the 80s, early 90s of AIDS. Uh, experimental artist. He was the music director for a couple of years of The Kitchen, the avant-garde uh, performance uh, space and organization in New York City. And he's a cellist. And this is uh, music that he worked on towards the end. He did a lot of experimental uh, home recording, home studio stuff, where he mixed cellos and guitars and keyboards and a lot of echo and voice work. Some of this is instrumental, some of it is voice work. It is somewhat of an avant-garde record, somewhat of a neoclassical. His, his vocals are very ethereal and haunting, um, but it's a beautiful record. It's adventurous, but it's not a difficult record to get into as far as you know. I'm concerned. Uh, I wouldn't say it's commercial, although, again, it is accessible, and the vocals are just lovely voices, uh, sometimes lyrically, sometimes just haunting mood pieces. And um, uh, his cello sometimes is, it sounds like it's been augmented with some electronics and some studio wizardly, wizardy, wizardly, wizard, you know what I'm talking about, effects, experimentation. Uh, but again, Arthur Russell, again, this was just put out this year. This had never been released before, and I just love it. So coming at number 19, Arthur Russell's album, and this is on Audica Records. Coming at number 18, and that is Julie Cruz's album, her debut, Floating Into the Night. Uh, this came out on Sacred Bones uh, record, licensed from Rhino and from Warner Brothers Records. Of course, Julie Cruz is the voice, uh, that very ethereal, uh, haunting uh, vocalist uh, that fronted uh, these songs by Angelo Badalamente and David Lynch uh, for Twin Peaks. Of course, it has the theme from Twin Peaks called Floating. Uh, beautiful, you know, that wonderful twangy surf-like guitar, and she does the vocals on it. And Floating Into the Night, perfect uh, title for this. Uh, this originally came out on CD that I got it. I think there was a very limited edition on vinyl way back, but I've been trying to find a nice copy of this. So finally, uh, this just came out this past year, and we lost her this year. Julie Cruz, unfortunately, has gone away. I hope they uh, issue the rest of uh, the albums, the other couple of albums she did for Warner Brothers uh, back in 1990. 1989, I guess, 19, around that time. But a fantastic, fantastic record. Coming at number 17, there's a trend here that uh, several of these records are records that I originally got in the CD era that I literally fell in love with. And uh, when I showcased Peter Gabriel's new album, I talked a little bit about a real world and an artist I called out and I totally had forgotten her name. And that was uh, Sheila Chandra. And this is a record that came out on Real World Records on Peter Gabriel's uh, world music label, an English Indian uh, woman from London. And uh, she has this great uh, vocal pattern and uh, effects she does with her mouth. And it, this is beautiful music. This is called Weaving My Ancestor's Voice, Speaking in Tongues. So literally she has this kind of tongue pattern music thing and, and just very... Uh, Eastern sounding music, very Indian, and what a lovely record this is. I've had the CD again for many years, uh, but finally uh, Real World Records put this out on vinyl. At, I assume it came out maybe limited edition back in the day, but I'm really um, hoping they put out uh, the additional records she did. Of course, she started out earlier as a TV star, uh, I think a children maybe actor in, in in the UK and did some other wonderful music for other labels. But Sheila Chandra coming at number 17. Coming at number 16, it's a record um, that I've always loved since it came out. And this is a record that Impex Records, the audiophile label, put out. It seems like it silent, silently slipped out and I haven't heard anyone, I haven't heard a beep out of anyone talking about Youngblood's Elephant Mountain. Uh, this is an unusual release for an audiophile label, but this is a wonderful sounding record, mastered by Kevin Gray, using a one-to-one -one transfer of the original analog tapes. But forget that, 
forget how great it sounds uh, for a, this record. This is a interesting record in the Young Bloods uh, career. I think it's probably their their best album. Of course, most people know them because of the anthem, uh, the Chet Power slash Dino Valenti song "Get Together." Love is but a song we sing. Fears the way we die. Come on, people now, smile on your brother. Everybody get together, trying to love one another right now. An anthem, a song for a generation. It's been in every movie about the 1960s ever made, I think. But this is their last album for RCA Records as they came west uh, to the Bay Area from New York. Uh, they lost a member. It was, there were a trio here. Uh, this was produced by a very young Charlie Daniels, that Charlie Daniels before he grew up and became uh, the Charlie Daniels that other people may know. Uh, several songs on here are just amazing songs. This is sort of a, a folky country, very California record. In fact, Elephant Mountain is this uh, mountain area in West Marin. But it opens up with Darkness, Darkness. Of course, Je Jesse Collins' young tenor, he's got this really sweet voice. So this is a sweet album, but it's a great album. There's some disjointed jazz pieces on here, instrumental pieces. It goes into uh, On Sir Francis Drake, and Sir Francis Drake Boulevard is this boulevard that goes in uh, in West Marin as well. And of course, when they were out there and they had lived out in Olima on uh, Western Marin, uh, they really entrenched themselves in there and wrote about what was happening there. It's a hippie album in a way too, but it's folk, jazz, country, uh, very soothing record. Uh, Beautiful music. Uh, Joe Bauer on drums, who really comes from a jazz background. So there's some interesting things there as well. And Banana is a, is a guitar player and does some really great stuff. There's a few like bits of fuzz psychedelia. Uh, this record came out originally in 1969, 68, 69, I believe. But there's also wonderful songs on here like uh, Quicksand, Full orchestra on it, really a catchy. Should have been a bigger hit than it was. This album did okay for them. But Ride the Wind is this long, uh, very soothing, almost like a light California West Coast jazz pop song. And it really leads into what Jesse Colin Young would, would uh, do later on his solo work. And uh, it's just a beautiful album. And I have my original on RCA. And for Impex to do this, I think it's an out of the box choice. I don't expect it to get a lot of love from people. Some of it is kind of weird, quirky, jammy, but not out there really, but just it like disjointed. But then it goes into this beautiful lullaby and this beautiful romantic song about, you know, it's a very environmental uh, record of California, Northern California of the day. A 1968's Young Bloods, Elephant Mountain. Just love it. What a surprise this was for me. Coming in at number 15 are uh, two records from the dance editions of Analog Africa. Analog Africa is a label I've been uh, into for about a decade, going back to African Scream Contest issues, uh, where he scours uh, Africa, the continents, and uh, South America and Central America for music, for things that hadn't been really release much in uh, the States and in Europe. And uh, these are two records from those dance editions. Uh, first, The Good Samaritans, Chapter One. There's been a lot of these Edo dance funk records that they're a mix of psychedelia, beats, dance, uh, trance music, uh, just really groovy is the word. I mean, there's great guitars, great bass, horns, and just a wonderful, wonderful music, really feel good music. The other one is um, from uh, Northern Brazil, and this is Ari Lobo. And uh, this was recorded in the late 50s, I believe, 1957 or 1958. And uh, this is a cool record. Again, uh, there's a funkiness to it, but there's just a joyous uh, feel to this record. I love, love this record. Uh, again, it's more Brazilian from the north of Brazil, and they went down into Rio, and uh, he became somewhat popular. First, there was this you know, prejudice of North. It's kind of like the Beatles coming from Liverpool going to London initially. Uh, but this is a wonderful, wonderful uh, collection of songs of his. And uh, these are just wonderful 
amazing archival records uh, that every time you put these on, you just want to keep playing them over and over again. And so usually when I play these, I'll put I'll pull five or six uh, records from my Analog Africa uh, collection and uh, go with them. Now number 14. That was 15. This is 14, if I got that wrong here. Uh, these are two records by Sinead O'Connor. I just showcased these, so I'm not going to dive deep in them. They've been issuing her uh, records uh, recently. Obviously, uh, we lost her also uh, this year. Uh, this is her third record that she did this record of sort of show tunes, Broadway show tunes, after her huge uh, hit of the cover of uh, the Prince song. And this is a lovely sounding record. And she tackles these great songs like Why Don't You Do It Right, Bewitched, Bothered and Bewildered, Black Coffee. Uh, she does Don't Cry For Me, Argentina on here. Great orchestrations. Over the top, but she nails these songs. And these records sound great. And the other one that I've been uh, dying for for a long time is Universal Mother. And a death, what I said in the video when I showcased these, this is like her Plastic Ono Band, John Lennon, angst record. A cry out, a cry from a mother. Uh, it's political, it's personal, sexual politics. Obviously, uh, her jabs at the church, but a beautiful uh, internal record. And um, it's, you know, this series, they've released, I think, Four of the records, her first two included, which I already have originals, so I didn't uh, grab those. But um, these are wonderful, wonderful uh, reissues of Sinead O'Connor's work. Uh, number 14, Sinead O'Connor. Uh, coming in at number 13, uh, this is a late entry, came out for Record Store Day Black Friday. And this is one of my favorite, if not my favorite, album by Los Lobos called Kiko, co-produced by Mitchell Froom. This is an expanded set from... Warner Records uh, reissue. I do have the MoFi. I think these are very close. They might sound slightly different. Maybe the MoFi is a little more bass, but this has a uh, this has a good groove to it and a lot of bass too and great mid range. Uh, this is spread over uh, two records, and then it has the Kiko sessions, some outtakes, an alternative, and then the last uh, side is some jamming. Uh, but what a beautiful record! I mean. The, the instrumentation of Los Lobos, they're in a way, they've become a jam band. If you ever get to see them live, they do obviously not just their, uh, you know, their border town music, their Mexican music, Spanish speaking music. They do great covers of things like the Beatles and and uh, Tomorrow Never Knows. I think I saw them play once. They're just an amazing, wonderful band. This is a tri-fold out and the sound is great. Uh, it again, spread. It's a long record, so spread over two discs makes so much sense. Los Lobos, Kiko, and that is number 13. Coming number 12 is another record that was expanded and, and spread over multi-disc. This one at 45 RPM. This is a record I've had on CD since it came out, and uh, this is a wonderful record. This is the Breeders, uh, the Deal Sisters uh, that left um, the Pixies. One of the sisters left the Pixies, and uh, this is their second album, and it is so good. It sounds really good. There's some ex a couple extra uh, singles on here, tracks on the last side. I believe there's a, um, so it's five sides of an album with a lovely uh, booklet inside. The, the Breeders, wonderful, wonderful, uh, you know, post-punk, new wave, shoegaze, uh, modern record, uh, just a, a fantastic record. Great artwork by uh, V23, also 4AD originally. Coming number 11 is a, is a record that I I almost forgot, and I pulled it out, obviously, because um, we just lost Shane McGowan, and I almost forgot about it, but then I realized how great it was. It was another Record Store Day earlier this year a release, and um, this is a Warner release out of the UK. This is a double album, and this is the Pogue Stiff Records B-Sides, 1984 to 1987. Of course, uh, this London-based Irish band, and uh, obviously Shane, no more. Uh, but these are great singles. These have all the B-Sides and uh, unreleased things, and it's just a great comp of these wonderful songs, of orphan songs in some cases brought together in one space. Uh, showcases of picture sleeves of the single. And this is a fantastic record. I mean, if you don't know the Pogues, there's sort of this Irish post-punk uh, side of, of things. 
and of course uh, Shane McGowan. What a great singer! Just a great uh, character and ch charismatic uh, figure. But uh, it was, let's really remember his music, how great it was and how powerful it was and how fun it was. Really fun stuff. So the Pogues uh, comp, the Stiff Records B-Size 84 to 1987. It was a Record Store Day release. Uh, coming at number 10, another expanded. You know, the, the key thing is uh, these records that came out in the late 80s into the 90s that originally on the compact disc side, they've expanded so the records breathe instead of cramming a long record on you know 45 50 plus minutes on two sides of a record uh the talking head stopped making sense now this has extra tracks that weren't on the original vinyl release and they finally made it to, to this release and of course the film was released on its anniversary i believe it was its 40th anniversary here uh and the group got together, at least for interviews and things. But what a great sounding record. Of course, the, the film was directed by Jonathan Demme. Uh, but this is the big suit record. Great acoustic guitars, great bass, great arrangements. Talking Heads, one of the best live uh, records ever. Uh, and this is Stop Making Sense by Talking Heads. And that is number... 10. Coming in at number nine is Calexico Feast of Wire, one of my all-time favorite albums. Uh, this is a slipcase of three LPs, so maybe it could have been in the box set. I kind of go back and forth on that. I did include the replacements in that other video that was a hybrid of vinyl and CDs. It just seemed more substantial. But uh, this is that, again, that Southwest band that has sort of a, a, a Tahana side to them. It has a Tex-Mex side. It has a very uh, very cinematic side, very much like Spaghetti Western soundtracks. I love Calexico, and I am an all-in on everything they put out. Uh, what a great classic record, starting with Sunken Waltz. So they have a mix of these sort of searing orchestration, haunting uh, sound-like type of orchestration with their country cowboy, um, even a little hip-hop, trip-hop mixed in sometimes on some of the remixes on here. But I just love this. Black Heart is, to me, one of the most beautiful things, and it's got an eerie side to it. Uh, this also includes the 45 RPM here of what was an EP that has their amazing cover of Love's Alone Again or from their Forever Changes record. And uh, the EP on here, it's just wonderful. And then there's a final disc of a live show in Sweden, contemporaneous uh, Lee recorded when this album came out around that time. So one of the one of the great reissues of the year, one of the great albums of all time in my case. And in fact, I think I I said this is one of the ba best records of this century, the best record of the century. I think I said that, didn't I? So that must be it was from two thousand something, two thousand one. Uh, Feast of Wire by the Great Calexico, and that is number nine. Coming at number eight. The record, strictly commercial, this is Overnight Sensation by Frank Zappa and the Mothers of Invention. This is when he got his own, again, another custom label, uh, Discreet Records uh, with Warner Records. And this is where the changeup happened. Of course, he was doing uh, a number of records. Mother's Invention never really made any money. They weren't selling. Uh, I got all in from their second record, and I went and continued on on that whole Frank Zappa a mother's journey. Uh, but this is the record uh, that in 1973 became his, one of his biggest selling records. This and the subsequent apostrophe. Apostrophe, I think, was the first one that went gold. They were recorded around the same session time, if not back to back. But this was reissued first. Now, I saw Zappa, the first time I saw him was with this band, earlier the year, uh, that year before this came out, with Jean-Luc Ponty and George Duke and uh, Underwoods on here, uh, and they're all over this. So this has a hybrid of, of that jazz fusion, but they're very commercial pop songs on here, hysterical as hell. Zappa sings most of the vocals, although um, Ricky... Lancelotti, I think the only time he's ever appeared on a Zappa record, sings like a couple tracks here. Over the top outrageous. But this is great where when fusion was happening, when prog was happening, 
Frank Zappa, the genius of Frank Zappa, that he was able to tame all the over uh, uh, ambitious side, or to me, overproduced from my point of view, all that jazz fusion that was just over the top, and all the prog as it became over the top after 1973, 74, just bloated as hell. He could bring it back, have this great, you know, essence of these these uh, quirky avant garde. Uh, solos and make it within a pop song and and do these hysterical uh, pop songs like Camarillo Brillo, Montana, I'm in the Slime, Dynamo Hum, sexual innuendo, sexual uh, and mocking of the hippie era, uh, the, the, the sense of humor that we all know uh, Frank Zappa had in his lyrics. Um, the thing that I read about this, what I didn't know at the time, and we weren't credited, is Tina Turner and the I Catch were on vocals, background vocals, on several of these songs. And, I mean, that's hysterical. I mean, sometimes they're manipulated and sped up. But this is a fantastic record. Now, this one, again, expanded to double 45 RPM over two sides. And it's, a, I think, Chris Bellman all analog cut. And it sounds really, really good. There is a... Uh, a booklet in it talking about, you know, essay on the album when it came out and how Frank Zappa was able to really cross over from that avant-garde and the jazz and the fusion, all those instrumental albums he was doing uh, prior to this, uh, prior to this part of Discrete Records. Uh, but this became uh, more accessible to people who had heard of Zappa, maybe heard a track here and there, but they jumped in this, and Apostrophe especially, for me, too. As much as I like this, I love Apostrophe better, especially that side one is one of the perfect sides in music, and that came out in 1974. Coming in number seven. Now, this is a group I missed the first time around back in 1992 to 2001, and this was a record that was sent to me by Light in the Attic, and I, I think it originally... They put this comp together in 2017, but this year, 2023, they did a repress. That's when I got it, so I'm sticking it in 2023. And this is Acetone. I didn't know Acetone. I heard their name, but I didn't know anything about their music. They're kind of a cool, um, meditative, psychedelic, maybe a little shoegaze, a little um, Mazzy Star, and I think, I actually hope Sandoval sang with them after the main singer uh, died. Um, you know, that's why they split up. I just noticed that all their albums have just been reissued by another label, so I may have to dive in, but this is a great double album comp. And I tell you, when I got this, I didn't know much about it, and I put it on, and I had this, I played this almost every day for about two weeks. It's that good, it's that serene, but it's kind of psychedelic in this kind of soft layer way. A beautiful package, Light in the Attic does some, some great reissues, and you know, I'm not including this just because of, this was a freebie because I get freebies from different labels. And if I don't like it or it doesn't really speak to me, this is great. Check this out. This is Acetone, 1992 to 2001. This might be a good introduction if you don't know their music. Fantastic. How did I miss them? I guess because I was a new father in 1990 and in 1990. And so I uh, wasn't getting out much. And I for some reason, didn't listen to this or didn't it didn't hit me. But I think this is an amazing thing. So I'm going to go eventually in the new year, jump in and maybe get some of those reissues of the proper albums. Coming number six, uh, two records back to back, and I showcase these. I, there's nothing much to say about them, but the 60th anniversary of the Kinks, Journey Volume 1 and Journey Volume 2. Uh, these are curated by Ray Davis, who put these together. And what I love about them, they're not in chronological order. He mixes it up. There's some deep cuts along with some of the hits. And I think it's a great way to discover the kinks. Kevin Gray cut these. Obviously, some of the sound varies because of the nature of when they were recorded. But it goes even into some of the uh, 1970s RCA theatrical stuff. But one of the greatest songwriters of my generation, of the generation above me, well, you know, Ray Davis. Just great, great songwriting. Great recordings and uh, two record sets, volume one and two, The Journey. Uh, BMG re released those and they're just fantastic. If that could be a good introduction to jump into Kinks, there's so many friggin' comps that have come out in the Kinks. And uh, I say 
Kink's Chronicles would be another one. It goes back to 1971 or 70, but don't get the Record Store Day one that came out three or four years ago. It's not very good. Fine and original. Uh, now coming in at number five, uh, I got two of these records because I have the other originals. And these are great because these were put out by Jackpot Records in Portland, Oregon. And these are the meters records that have been hard to get. Now, the covers are a little, I mean, okay, a little blurry, but this, this sounds great. Again, Kevin Gray cut these, if you want to know about sound. New Orleans, funky, soulful music. Great records, of course. Uh, these were produced by um, Alan Toussaint, I believe. Uh, well, Marshall E. Seahorn and Alan Toussaint. So it's got the New Orleans funk, the New Orleans soul. These are upbeat dance, get off your ass records. So any of this series of the Meters records on Jackpot, get them. If you don't have them, if you, if you like this music, buy them all. But I had the other ones. I only bought the ones I didn't have because I, you know, you don't always have to go in on every version. And I'm kind of trying to get away from repeat repeating uh, tracks, although the kinks are different. And there's a couple live tracks uh, on uh, one of them that were never issued before. Coming number four. Of course, in the last year, we lost Burt Baccarat. But this is the songs of Burt Baccarat and Elvis Costello. I love this record. Now, this is one. I do have the MoFi. The MoFi is excellent. This one um, has extra songs that were recorded at the time uh, that adds to this. But this is this wonderful collaboration of songwriting by one of the great uh, songwriters of all time, Burt Bacharet, who wrote with Hal David. And of course, Elvis Costello, too. Um, I know I think they first got together way back when uh, they were uh, doing something in um, one of the Austin Powers films. I don't know if that's the genesis of this collaboration. Uh, I am exactly two days older than Elvis Costello. Uh, I bumped into him once in a New York restaurant with uh, Diane Krall. I didn't bump into Diane. I bumped into Elvis Costello. Excuse me, mate. Did I say that or did he say that? We both had hats on. Um, there you go. But this is just that it's a schmaltzy, beautiful record. And it sounds really good. And it finally came out. There was an expanded box set, I believe. Was that the, with the CDs and everything? I did not get that. But I just love this record. But again, when it first came out, I had got the CD and it didn't speak to me. And I think the vinyl sounds much better. Maybe that's why. That didn't speak to me, but this is such a great record. Number four in my 2023 list of archival releases. Coming in at number three of archival releases and reissues are two records by Little Feet that Rhino Records put out. Uh, I did do a conversation with Jason Jones from Rhino who curated these, who put these together, produced them for release. These are three record sets. These are two of... Little Feet's wonderful catalog. One of those bands that doesn't get enough love. They're a great, funky, soulful rock band out of L.A. Uh, Lowell George, the front man, the singer, once he died, um, they took a hiatus and they kind of continued on. They're still together. They're still playing. And I haven't seen them uh, since the Lowell George days, but I hear they're fantastic anyway. But Dixie Chicken and Salem Shoes are two fantastic records. Uh, there's a connection later because uh, Lowell George with the meters uh, backed Robert Palmer on Sneak and Sally Through the Alley. And they have some of that New Orleans style funk uh, rock and roll thing uh, and some jazzy influences and country roots too. Uh, again, there's a linkage to Frank Zappa, uh, but you can read elsewhere about all that. Now they have uh, outtakes on them and rarities on these records are, again, they're trifold. Uh, they have a live show. This one has one out of uh, Boston in 1973. But they have wonderful gatefolds with lyrics, credits, and wonderful uh, photographs and great uh, cover art by uh, the late Neon Park who did all almost all their records, not their first one, uh, their first self-titled record. And then there's Salem Shoes, another fantastic record. Again, a trifold that has also a live uh, and outtakes on here as well. And now we're down to the final two. Coming in at number two from Sam Records, Big Bill Brunzi. A lot of double diptych type 
uh, offerings in this video. I'm realizing there's a lot of pairings going on. So uh, we like pairings in this case uh, because this is wonderful music. Now, Sam Records is this independent one-off record maker who finds these recordings. Sometimes they're unreleased, but a lot of them are just things that have been issued only in France in the 50s and the 1960s. And these are recordings uh, recorded by the blues, American blues artist, Big Bill Brunzi. It's got sort of a country blues sound, folk blues sound. These are amazing sounding records. They're 45 RPM, EPs in essence, and there's two volumes, silk screen covers. They have a little bit of a different uh, color. This has a brown tint. Uh, this has a greenish tint. If you know the Muddy Waters folk singer, this is in that realm. And these are these limited editions that are somewhat pricey, but these are amongst my favorite records. That's why I'm including them at number two here. But of all the lists, of all the box sets, of all the new releases, these are up there pretty high, and I've been playing these quite a bit. So Sam Records, Big Bill Brunzi. I don't know if they're still available uh, again, but you have to order them directly from Sam Records in Paris and uh, just an amazing uh, couple of records and great music. I mean, again, it's about the music, as you know. Now, coming in at number one, I could have gone back and forth. I almost put Big Bill Brunzi at number one. But when all is said and done, these are the ones that I've kind of been anticipating and I really, really love these records. And I, I went back to rock and roll with some little, you know, post-punk fusion uh, thrown in very unusual band. Again, a uh, member died on stage uh, way back. Morphine. These are from Light in the Attic Records. These are my favorite reissues, archival reissues from, uh, from 2023. I just love these records. There's a moodiness to it. There's a, there are a trio of bass saxophone, like a bass saxophone, long saxophone, and drums. And they're dynamic as hell. The music sounds great. There's an immediacy to them, and it's just really, really fun music, but really, like, it's just killer music. It's, you feel uh, this band, and it's really interesting how they, you know, they went into more experimental and different mode, and it's unfortunate uh, what they would have gone on to, because at some point after several records with that trio, of that configuration, you got to explore other things. So they bring on some string sections on here. They bring on some other things. Uh, on uh, the latter album, but uh, Morphine's The Night and Morphine's Like Swimming, Light in the Attic Records, just fantastic music. And I think it's the kind of exploration, if you don't know this band, you should like check into their music. Uh, and uh, each of them has booklets so you can read all up about them, but um, Light in the Attic 2023 makes my number one with morphine. So thanks for watching. There's more over the next uh, few weeks ending up 2023. Mazzy loves you.